So mine is a presentation about problem solving in Cinema 4D. It's something as motion designers we all do, and it's a thing you have to kind of get used to and familiar with the tools to be able to solve problems you know, whenever they come down the production line. So like Matthias said, my name's Isaac Terex. I'm a freelance 3D artist here in New York. Um, I've worked with places like Imaginary Forces um, as a freelancer, and I've worked at Google as a contractor for the YouTube team. And I'm just going to really quickly play my reel so you can kind of see the kind of work that I work on, and then we can go into the rest of the presentation. Yeah, so thanks. That's um, kind of the work that I do. And as you can kind of tell, like half of that's kind of branded stuff that I do, which is like kind of more client facing. The other half are personal projects and experimentations I just do in my own time. And that's what we're going to be going over today and kind of how working for clients, there's a problem that comes along and it kind of birthed these personal projects where I explore kind of how to do things, different workflows. And then they normally, you know, are brought back in as something to do for a nor, uh, like a client later down the road. So another thing that I want to cover, which is because most of those are personal projects, why are they important and why do they matter for artists and why should you kind of keep pressing to do them? And a few of the ideas are just that in reality, R&D or, you know, exploration during production is something that we think we're going to have and we kind of book it in and it never really happens. And you kind of are left, you know, if you do these personal projects on your own time, you're building up assets that, you know, will help you down the road. The other thing is that because it's your own, there's low risk. When you're in the middle of production, you decide we're going to go this new route we've never done before. It's not typically well advised because if it doesn't work out, oh no, the deadline's still there and you still have to deliver the project. So you normally fall back on things that you've done before and it could kind of stunt how much you're, you know, pushing the programs that you're in. The last thing is that it's a great way to learn new skills and new workflows while not trying to do it on the job. I mean, some of us have to do that in you know, YouTube while we're working to figure something out last minute, but if you keep kind of doing these personal projects and explorations, you can kind of build up an arsenal of different random tests that you've done and kind of cherry pick them to bring them into your projects once you're kind of already going. So these are the projects we're going to go over. One is about creating beer foam using Cinema 4D only. The second is an audio responsive liquid surface, which I'll explain what that weird title means later on. And the last is a glass shatter that is all done inside of cinema using some techniques that were done in Houdini. So the first one is the beer foam. And these are the renders um, that we're going to kind of be going into, specifically just the beer foam. This was rendered in Octane, and it kind of grew out of a, an interest in if we could do fully modeled geometry instead of a texture, which we normally did at my place. And, it definitely was an experience to kind of figure out how to do this. Um, it's something I've never done before. I'm not really a modeler, so I was kind of hoping that Cinema's tools just out of the box could kind of help me get through this. And just going to break down some of the challenges, which was R20 had just come out. The new fields, volume builder and mesher were new things that I thought were really exciting, and I never really got time you know, during a production to do it. So I wanted to take a personal project to really dive into them and figure them out and how I could use them later on. The other one was I needed a procedural workflow. The kind of advantage of not using a texture and using this all was that I didn't have to sculpt anything or I didn't have to rely on baking things out. It could kind of be responsive to an art director coming in and saying, no, we don't want this, we want that, which happens you know, all the time as motion designers. Someone comes in and they really want to have their vision seen. The other thing is that I wanted to push the photorealistic fidelity of the project. These were normally in um, the agency I was working at. Sometimes these would be next to photo like photos that were done and they kind of had to live up to it and be able to you know, play in the same field. So if we look at some reference, this was kind of the hurdles was, when you look at foam, it looks solid, but it's also just made up of a ton of tiny microscopic spheres. 
And when you think of that in 3D terms, that's a volume with you know, sphere packing all the way through at different sizes. And that just sounds like a computational nightmare if you're trying to clone all these spheres inside of there. But the nice thing about the um, noises inside of uh, Cinema 4D's volume builder, mesher, and the new fields shader is that you can use procedural noises so you don't have to actually copy any geo. And it can be stacked on top of each other in a nice Boolean operation all just with you know, vanilla Cinema 4D without any plugins on top of it. So if we jump into Cinema right now, this is the whole scene in its entirety. It was rendered in Octane. It just has a, a nice sweep, one light, an HDRI. The glass is modeled pretty just with a basic lathe. The beer is the same. And then these are two Alambic files. Once I kind of got the look I was going for, it made sense to not have Cinema try to cache and you know, keep thinking about this file. So I just saved it because Cinema is really great at saving out Alambic files after you're done and baking them out. And so we're just going to jump into kind of how this was all built up. So these are the two Alambic files. There's a Alambic file for the bubbles, and then the rest of it is the foam. And if you look without the bubbles on, so the foam is just a solid chunk which you know, on the surface looks, it looks like, but then there's all these dents that are kind of chunked out of it. And if you, you know, go into a side view, you can look at the nightmare that is this wireframe. It just looks solid, because inside of this volume, there are a ton of tiny little spheres that are being taken out of the entire hole, which really helps sell the fact that it's this foam versus you know, a texture can only kind of cover you on the surface with subsurface scattering. But if you actually make geo, that has that all the way through a kind of a Boolean operation through the entirety of it, you really get the correct light bounces and it makes it kind of that airy feeling. So if we go back here, I'm just gonna break down how these were done. So the, the base was to build out this foam and I wanted to do it procedurally. I didn't want to sculpt anything. So it's just, you know, if you turn off these two displacements, it's just a disc and then adding some procedural Cinema 4D noises on top of it at two different levels and making sure that kind of the fall off so the bottom stays flat because that's something that happens. Only the top has kind of that undulation to it. So this was just the base shape. And this is all we had to do, you know, as far as modeling. It's not even really modeling. It's just a couple kind of effectors after it. And then that was taken. And we're going to jump into the foam here in the volume builder. I'm just going to scroll down. And this size, which is the voxel size, is extremely dense. I did it at a really low value so that I could get all of the detail inside of it. So I'm just going to multiply that by two, just so that we can kind of give this computer a little bit of a break. Turn that on. And it's actually a lot faster than I thought it would be. OK, so we've just dragged this foam directly into the volume builder, which is nice that Cinema allows you to kind of reference something multiple times without have to using kind of their stacking system. They're moving more towards this, which allows a lot more of a procedural workflow later down the road. If you want to use something in two different volume builders, you don't have to duplicate it or instance it. You can just drag them in, and it works right out of the box. So we have the foam here. And it's, if we turn on the mesher, it's pretty much what we've started with, and we haven't done anything to it. And then the next thing on top of this are these noises. They are Cinema 4D. If you go into Create and go into the fields, these are all the fields which you know, typically would be used for fall off, but also work inside of the volume builder. So the shader field here is what it's driving here. And if we go and look at them, they're just using your standard, you know them, Cinema 4D noises. Inside of here, this is a Voronoi 1, which is like a cellular pattern, which is what I figured would drive the best because it makes circle shapes. And in 3D space, they'll make spheres. And that's kind of how we're going to cheat that sphere packing without having to do any cloning. So if we go into this cell noise, and Alt-R to get a little bit of render. These are the noises that are stacked up in three different layers. There's kind of this like more microscopic one, which is doing a ton of little spheres, and they're intersecting a little bit. We go up and scale it, and we clamp it down again. And then if we just move over here, this final one, you know, they're pretty much just spheres by themselves because the clamp is so high. And that's just changing inside the noise this low clip. So if we adjust that up a little bit, you can see we get more spheres, and there's more, you know, they're touching each other's sides, but if you bring it down, you can kind of isolate them to themselves. So this was the main idea behind this whole thing, to get all those spheres inside without actually using any geometry and just shaders to keep it procedural. So if we go back here, the other kind of challenge that came with this is that because I was working at such a high resolution, to be able to visualize how these spheres work, you have to be at a really high resolution or else they don't really appear spherish. They appear kind of like blobs, and it was hard to kind of tell if I was in the right direction. 
But Cinema allows you to kind of mask where this is going to take effect inside of the 3D noise. And so you can tell that it's 12 inches you know, for the full thing, but this is just you know, a fraction of that, just a little sliver. So if we turn on this small detail, you can see this is what it's kind of doing inside. And it's only this one little sliver. So you can kind of, I could tell what was happening internally and on the surface if we just zoom in there without having to do it across the entire volume. And so that's just how I art directed it. And it kept it really fast and iterative without having to kind of be bogged down waiting for this to calculate the volume every single time. And these are just set to subtract with the foam below them. So these will just kind of do like your standard Boolean operation and cut out anything on the inside. And that's you know, what drove kind of this effect. So if we stack that, the medium, and the large, it's pretty responsive, a lot more than I thought it would be when I was doing it. And you can kind of tell, you know, you got these big ones and there's not many around them, and they keep kind of stacking. So starting with the small and going to big, make sure that there's no little spheres inside of the big spheres, which was kind of a trouble and an issue that I ran into. So the next part of this was, that's the inside cover. That's all that I ever I did for this. And then I wanted, you know, the other thing I struggled with with textures was how do you get those bubbles? So the foam kind of is covered with this Boolean operation, but the foam needs to be bubbles that are, you know, clear on the surface. So what I did there was that's where turning on cloner here, just on the surface, was able to kind of marry the two together. So this is just a cloner with another shader. And this shader is just kind of, if we turn these two off, this is what cloning on the surface looks like. This is what you know, we've done a thousand times. But if you turn on the shader effector, you're just going to shrink down things based on the black and white of this noise value. And then I'm just colorizing on top of it so you can really kind of tell, OK, so if this is white, that means there's going to be a lot of shrunken ones. And if this black, that not taking up that much of the gradient, there's going to be a few that are kind of the bigger ones here. So if you just slide these over, you can kind of start to see how this affects it. And so just clamping these down, you make sure that there's a lot more small and a few big ones. And then using on top of that, the push apart effector set to just scale apart. Make sure that any that are you know, intercepting each other will just shrink until they're not doing that anymore. And it's a really great way of making sure nobody's you know, interpenetrating each other. And they all cover the surface. If we turn the foam back on, they all cover the surface in like a, a normal pattern that you would expect. And that was great to kind of get them there, but I also needed them to do the same as those noises were and kind of cut out chunks of that foam so that they weren't interpenetrating and there would be no render errors because this was going to be rendered as glass. And so that's where the instancing came in. So I built them in a different volume builder. We turn this off. So I just dragged them in here and put them at the bottom. Turn this on. Just going to double that. So we get them there. And they're just how we want them. We mesh them again. And you're kind of back to square one. But because now they're in the volume builder, you can do interesting things. And when I clone them, because they're spheres, they don't know there's an edge of the glass that they have to kind of interact with. And the foam was actually a great thing to instance. So if we turn the foam on, I didn't want to use the foam because anything that touched the surface of the foam would then be cut off as well if you intersected them. But being able to use instances, you can kind of just instance it and scale up in just the Y. So you're kind of giving clearance for anything that's on the surface, but you're attaining the same wall. And because it's an instance, it's still parametric throughout. So if you change what your base foam model is and the radius gets a little bit bigger, it's still going to respond because it's an instance. And then the instance is what's used in here if we turn these two off and let it calculate. The instance is just set to intersect. And you can kind of see all these flat edges on the walls make it so that there's no render issues when you go to render this as a clear glass object and it's touching the wall of the other glass that's holding the beer liquid. So that was something that was you know, another thing, kind of had to troubleshoot. And then using this same cloner, not in here, but inside of the foam at the very top, just turning it on so that it then does its own subtract on top of the foam using the cloner that's using the foam as the base geometry. So it's all kind of interconnected and a little bit convoluted and very technical. But if you just add all these together, you can kind of get something that you know, is driven from the core of your base object all the way through. So that you don't really have to kind of like re-export things. It's all you know, one update, and everything works out through the rest of it. So that's kind of how these were done. And it used a few reshape layers just to make sure the intersections between them were all you know, taken care of. And then if we turn this one on in the same way, 
and we just have that noise in the sliver there, and it's going to think about meshing it. OK. If you just trust me that this is the end result, after you can up all the resolutions, you use all those techniques, this is kind of what you'll end up with at the end. And then I'm gonna just going to go in the last 10%, which was the texturing of this in Octane, which used subsurface scattering and triplanar to kind of use those same ideas and use procedural noises again, but in the texturing on the bump map that really kind of sold it when you got up close. So if we just go into Octane, open the live viewer, I'm just going to dock this to the side. And so we can start it. So if we zoom in here, you can kind of see it. The lighting's a little bit dark. But so anything that's on the side, the bump is going inside. So it's acting as though the same thing. It's touching a wall. And anything on the top is curving upwards like it should if it was a bubble. And that was all done in, you know, you can do it in Octane or Redshift or anything that has triplanar. That's kind of the thing that sold this idea. So if we open up this Octane texture, pause the live viewer. This is the node tree for it. It looks a little daunting, but it's actually extremely simple. So we start here with Octane's own circular noises. And so it's, you, know, you don't have to use any imagery. It's all you know, infinite scale because you're working with noises. And then they just go into Octane's triplanar, just so that I was remembering I was working with triplanar. And then you just, for the tops, you just keep them as they are, kind of gradient ramp them so you can kind of control how high the bump is. And then the nice thing is you just invert those and re-gradient them for the sidewalls. And after you do that and a couple of mixed nodes, you can just then take the triplanar node and make sure that anything that's going to be the walls, so anything in X or Z, is inverting that bump. And anything that's going on the top or the bottom is using the bump in the normal way that it should. And that's kind of a great way to add just that little 10% on top of it and really push the visual fidelity. Again, the rest of this was subsurface kind of sells the rest of that idea. But you know, with our graphics card, I don't really want to have you sit here and wait for something to clean up and finish the render. But just trust me, just add a couple. If we just look at the subsurface, it's really nothing crazy. You know, it's just you know, two colors here, very faint colors with a, you know, a density that I played around with and kind of found worked. And that's all that the additional is. This one's also using the same kind of setup that I just showed in the other one for its bump, so they have the same bump. Um, and then they're just mixed in the same material over here. So that's everything that was problem solving with that. And I definitely found things that I used later on um, in different projects. Uh, we ended up not going with this because we found out that our camera was going to be far away. and. They didn't want to you know, deal with all this geometry. They just went with a texture. But it was something to, nice to know that if we ever needed animation or something that was close up on the surface of the foam, we had figured it out. And it was just you know, due to doing a personal project. So after that, we're going to go into audio responsive liquid surface. And that is a crazy name for just saying a surface that's animation is driven by an audio file. And this was born out of the idea that we had a client, and it was for a pitch. And they, it was a, a whiskey. And the whiskey was aged in a barrel where they blasted this band's music at it and during the aging process. And they wanted a way to show that that was interesting and it was last minute add to this kind of presentation. And the biggest challenges were that the animation had to be driven by audio that we didn't know at the time. So I couldn't kind of bake anything out or keyframe anything. It would have taken too long. So that was part of it, which kind of drove to a procedural workflow again. You know, you don't know what audio file you're going to use, so you kind of just have to be able to swap it at the last minute and hope everything runs properly. And the last is that it's a tight deadline. We had a day and a half, I think, to do this and kind of just add it inside of the project. And so that means no liquid simulations, none of that time to, you know, kind of play with that and figure it out and kind of rely on physics or anything. So we had to figure it out just with Cinema 4D tools and render it out. So I'm going to jump in to show what that file looks like. It's a, it's kind of a short clip. That was the other thing. We didn't, it took up two seconds of this video, so we didn't really have the time or you know, justification to do this big liquid simulation for it. That was it. And they wanted it, and they wanted it bad, so we had to do it, and we had to do it in a quick way. So that's the file, and it was just inserted inside this pitch, so I can't really show the rest of the video. But if we go into Cinema, just close this, and open up that file. Another thing that Cinema has kind of really pushed for in updating is their viewer and the ability to kind of bring in an HDRI that you're going to use. This was rendered in Octane, but I didn't really have time to keep rendering out this animation, see how it looks with the light, 
but I found that I could just kind of make proxy materials, you know, a reflective edge, a reflective black surface, use the lighting I would use in Octane, and I could get something that I kind of do a play blast, show the art director, and he's like, I think that works. And so that was something that Cinema has really pushed forward in their new releases, and I think it's a great addition. You know, play blasts are becoming better and better, and they look better and better, and people can kind of understand a little bit more what you're going to do and trust that it's going to turn out great when you kind of do the final render and comp on it. So for this effect, Cinema already, you know, they have sound effectors, and newly added to Art20, they have sound fields. And that's kind of where I, I, I went immediately. I wanted to kind of use those on top of driving the effectors that would displace the surface. There's a little bit of Expresso later on, but I'm just kind of, kind of build up to that and kind of build this back up. So these are all the effects that are used. It's formula and displace, and a little bit of jiggle at the end. Things that you know, we've used 100 times. And this was just because when I first looked at this, it showed when I looked at references, there was a lot of rippling that happened when something's played under a speaker and a lot of audio. And then there's additional displacement. But they're very key. So I knew that ripple meant we were going to use formula because that's what it does. So if we just turn this on and we go to animate play sound, you can actually hear the audio file. Turn this off so that we were working with a little bit nicer of a, of a mesh. So already it's doing kind of what we want. And the way it's set up is that the sound field is loading in this audio wave. And these probes are you can, a way you can target which kind of part of the audio you want to do. So if we watch this in real time, you can tell we're just grabbing the bass. And that's all I wanted the ripple to kind of be driven by. And the sound field is being used in the formula as a fall off. It's pretty simple, you know. So without it on, it just looks like this all the time and it just animates out. And so to turn it on and off, you just set that as the fall off. And so any time that the audio kind of creeps up into this probe that we have down here, if we scroll down. So this is the ceiling. So anything up there is like fully turning on the formula. And anything below that is you know zero. So as it grows up, it turns it on. And that was great. The only thing that really had to change in here was I don't know what these formulas are. I don't know the math behind them. I just know that if you multiply times by five, it goes faster. So this is kind of you know your standard. I'm going to turn off animation so we don't have to hear that every time. So this is just what it's going to do by default. It's just going to ripple out. And if we turn on, it looks a lot better. So this is just you know your standard formula. And I was like, that's great. But we kind of want it to be a little bit more energetic because this is rock and roll. So you just multiply that times five. And it speeds up a bunch. And this is great for like the constant. And then just using that fall off on top of it, you can kind of turn it on and off. And that worked for that. But then the displacement was where it kind of got a little bit more technical. And I had to use some Espresso to link things up. But it's, you know, it's still basic concepts. So if we look at the displacement, it kind of comes up, and it animates, and then it goes down. And this is where the sound effector comes in, because Espresso is really smart in a way that it can kind of pull data from an effector. So this looks daunting, but it's not. So if you just pull the sound effector in, you're already at step one. Then you just search sample in the Expresso searching. So if you just search sample, it's under MoGraphs. And then you're here, then just a range mapper and anything you want to map to. So what this is doing is essentially saying, sound effector, what do you want me to read? And you just tell it the object, which is the audio file that's inside of the sound effector. And you're saying it's an effector, not a global matrix. And then you're saying what you want it to pull. So it takes the audio file and the peak level, and it goes and makes that a strength number. And if you have a number, you can ramp it to other numbers. So that's what all of these range mappers are doing. It looks complex. They're all just kind of saying, if this is this value, make it this value here. And so that's where you can really get that fine-tuned control. You can say the position should be in between these ranges. The height should only be between these ranges. The noise is being animated, so the animation on top of the displacement shader is being animated. And then the spherical fall off is also being animated. So it's easier to represent, show that in something that's not linked up to Espresso. So if we pop out of the camera here and turn these on so they're visible. So all that's happening, actually, if we show this first, you can kind of see it in action. And I'll break down what those ramps are doing. So this is what the effect is doing based on the audio. And you can really tell that like, as it gets louder, the, the fall off shrinks. And then 
everything else is being animated additionally based on what it's linked up to. So I'm just going to go and kind of show. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight things that are being mapped to. And all that you're mapping is in the object, the height, which is essentially the strength. So if you know, if it gets louder, it should be bigger. And if it's quieter, it should be smaller. So you just range map that height. And then inside the shader, you're also changing based on sound the scale. So if it becomes you know, a lot more noisy, there's more finite distortion in there. And then as it kind of cools out, there's you know, a little bit more bigger blobs that are happening. And then on top of it, you're also kind of changing the animation speed. So at two, it undulates about like that. But then when nothing's happening, it's kind of chilling out. If you're like at 0.5, it just goes a lot slower. And that's all being ranged by the audio levels that it's reading in through Expresso. So if we turn that off, this will do nothing. And then you're additionally adding in the Y direction, which is changing, you know, because it's a 3D noise, it's changing exactly the position, which is a little bit more energetic than just doing the animation speed. So if you watch that at 1%, it's, it's pretty crazy because it's traveling through the Y space. And as it kind of cools down to something more like half of that, it's a little bit cooler. And then when you add in this animation speed, they're all working together, so you can't really place what's changing. It's just getting more energetic. So that was all the Expresso setup. And that's what this display is doing on top. So if you turn these three all on, this is kind of the effect. Turn our spherical field back on. Just going to turn this off for quicker playback. So this is kind of the basic setup. Everything's being driven by audio. Great. That's looking awesome. But it doesn't look like liquid. It just looks like you're displacing a surface. And this was kind of the part where I was like, what do I, what do I add to this so that it can kind of look like liquid? And that's where Jiggle came in. Because Jiggle will just kind of say, what's happening before me? And I'm just going to kind of smooth it all out and make it kind of blend together like a liquid surface would. And the other amazing thing about this is that it caches anything. So you can kind of do it at a whole high res. And I'd use this multiple times. I can't remember who showed me. But if you just use it and you set it to zero strength, you can still just cache any effectors above it. And it's like a really quick way just to cache anything that's kind of taking a long time to preview. So if we empty this cache, calculate, it's just going to run through it. I'm just going to let it go for a little bit. But you can kind of already see the, the melding between the displacement, but also the ripples. They kind of fade in and out of each other. And because it's all driven by the same audio, they're all kind of linked together. So that just took up 13 megabytes. And now you can real-time playback all of those effects, even though it's subdivision surfaced at the top. So this was a um, key finding in it. And at the end, you know, we get something with you know, a little bit of octane and everything on top of it. We get something like this and a little bit of a snippet. So that's kind of everything that went into this. It's a lot faster than trying to do a liquid simulation. And it's all just using things that you're really comfortable with and already use. I mean, maybe Espresso is new or something. But all of these ideas and concepts are pretty basic when you kind of boil them down. So the next scene, or the next project that we're going to go into is a glass shatter. So this was something where it was kind of in, we had some R&D time, and they just wanted us to explore a bunch of different options for this branding and kind of create just cool motion graphic pieces that we could later use to kind of splice in as like B-roll. And the main challenges of this one was that a glass shatter from an impact kind of has to start at one point and then radiate out from there. So there's kind of finite shatters in the middle, and on the edges, there's these longer shards. And it's very specific how glass shatters, and it doesn't look anything like a Voronoi shatter. So kind of when someone's like, let's fracture it, you're like, Voronoi. But it's kind of, you know, you can place it. And once it's done wrong, you're like, wow, that's not a very good fracture. So that was the first one. The next one is that they wanted it in slow motion, which means physics are out the window because it's going to be art directed, and everything can kind of get jittery, and the caching sizes of everything. You have so many frames if you want to slow it down. That was out the window. It had to be done with effectors and kind of really art directable. And that was the last thing, art directable movement. We had someone that really had a vision of kind of what he had in his head. And so if we had to kind of turn off one shatter piece, we had to be able to do that. And so using you know, physics or anything wasn't going to really fly. The other part was this was when I was kind of getting into Houdini. And so the original project that I'm going to show here was done in Houdini. But I'm going to show you a setup that I figured out that's pretty much the same thing, but using things that you're comfortable with in cinema to achieve the same effect. So if we go into the glass shatter, so this is the effect. This was also rendered in Octane. And so it's pretty quick. And I mean, there's a lot of cheats that are kind of covering some things that are technically not correct in here. There's a lot of depth of field. There's refraction. The lighting is kind of optimal for this angle and everything. 
but I'm just going to kind of break down first how to do this fracture inside of Cinema, and then how to animate it afterwards. So actually, I want to give a quick shout out to Chen Chia Chang. Vimeo is Sohei. He kind of came up with this like method at first, which is a really smart way of doing it. He did it in Houdini, and I was like, there's no way I'm going to port this over to Cinema. He had all these like attributes he was creating and using normals. But I found a way that kind of abuses a few effectors and gets to the same result. So this is the main concept we're going to be going over. So to get this impact point, you kind of deform the geo from that impact point. So the center is extremely stretched. And as you go further to the edges, it stretches less. You fracture it because Voronoi doesn't care. It just does the Voronoi fracture. And then you inversely deform it back inwards. And that kind of gives you those shards that kind of seem like they're generating from one area. So I'm just going to jump into that scene. And we can kind of go over that. So this is what we're starting with. It's just a plane. And you can see all these stacks, which means it's procedural, which means you know, when they come in, they're like, actually, we want it to be a disk or something. We can kind of handle that. And the main kind of workhorse here is Spherify, which is not the way you should use Spherify. And this is not what it's intended for. But if you put it directly level with your surface, it wants to push everything from the center and make a sphere out of it. And it has this like natural fall off, which was something that I was like, wow, that's exactly what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to push from this one center point, And kind of as it goes away, if you turn on the Spherify and it follows a box field. And that's to kind of make sure that this edge stays the same. So if we turn this off, this is what Spherify really wants to do. So you're just kind of toning it down just at these edges so that it can do the center, but it doesn't really change your normal shape. And then because you're improperly using Spherify, you kind of have to smooth out these edges afterwards to make sure that everyone's you know, happy, not overlapping points, and that's all good. So now we got this weird you know, shape, and you might be thinking this is not what you should be doing, but it is. You then Voronoi fracture it. So this is all contained inside the Voronoi fracture. And the Voronoi fracture doesn't really care that you've deformed the geometry. It just kind of stamps its Voronoi fracture on top. And something I found that really helped this was not just using what it by default starts up with the distribution, which is great, but adding a shader on top of that that says, in the center here, based off a gradient, which is set to circular, in the center, have a lot more fractions. And as you go further away from the center, you can kind of just have a lot less. So if we just show this inside of the Voronoi, and we turn off this distribution, this is what it looks like. But the problem is these edges then have like no fracturing, which they still need a little bit of something. So you just, the two kind of work together. So because shaders, the shader is first, it kind of gets priority on what it gets to fracture. And then the distribution just kind of picks up anything that might be fractured in you know, too long of a direction and it refractures it. And this is like, OK, it may seem like there's a lot here. But that's because if you kind of up how many fractures you're doing, and then you go into geometry glue, which is set to cluster. And thanks for Chris Schmidt for kind of thinking of this idea. And then you use that kind of set to a little bit higher number, and we turn off the wireframe. You get a little bit more organic shapes. You start to break up that Voronoi fracture into something that's a little bit more organic or looking like that. And then this is the, you know, the whole kind of idea is that, OK, we've distorted it. It's staying in its box form. Now we have to get it back into you know, that center point. And if you improperly use the taper and just set it just above your plane, you can then turn it on. And everybody snaps back to the center because it wants to taper, but only into that one point. And so now you have this glass shatter that's generating. I don't know any other way to do this inside of Cinema. I've seen a few people that kind of bring Illustrator files in with really art-directed shatters, and that seemed not procedural in any way. So this was like a, a quick way to kind of get this shape if you want it. And because it's all inside of Cinema Tools, it's all, it can be stretched and everything can work together. And you're just using a couple. So the taper is using a spherical fall off. And that's not right. And so you just kind of invert the box field again, remap it with this to invert it. And then you just put that on top as a subtract. So you make sure that that edge stays the same and it doesn't get tapered. And only the center kind of gets tapered in based off your spherical fall off. So with these two on, you can kind of see them kind of in proportion to the scene. So now you have a fracture and you want to start animating it. But you don't want to bake out this into different geo. And the nice thing is that the fracture object says, that's exactly my job. That's all I want to ever do. And you just set me to explode segments. And I will take anything that's coming in. And I would just pretend like it's real geometry separated by itself. So if you turn that on, it turns white, and nothing's happened. But the other great part about the fracture is it wants to read effectors. And so that's how all the animation is done, which I'll go into a separate scene for. But just to show kind of the idea, 
is that this is just a random effector, and it's all treating those as individual pieces. And you can kind of start to see how this happens. So if you kind of just start shattering from the center and you go out, then you can kind of do that with just the fracture object, and you don't have to bake anything out. So I'm going to jump into the other scene here. And this is the scene that was actually done. So this is using the same idea, just with some files um, of Geo from Houdini. And then if we just play forward here, probably cut it off at 33. This is the whole animation. And so the flicker between these two is just to avoid, because all this geometry is sitting there, but it's pre-fractured, you see it because it's glass. And so just swapping out a normal plane of glass and then your fractured glass is a cheat, but it definitely works just based on impact. And you can kind of get all these pieces to fall out from it. The other challenging part was I wanted to you know, have the center kind of bend in as though it was being impacted and the sides kind of follow, but later. And first I was like, that's a target effector. We're going to use a target effector. No, we're not going to use a target effector because that was really wonky and it didn't do anything I wanted and the pitch was all, all over the place. And I ended up actually using this quadrant system that uses a little bit of espresso, but it's really very basic espresso. I'm just going to prove it. It's just one shader into the other. So all these shader effectors use the same shader and you can kind of only change it in one master area and it applies to all the other effectors. So if we turn off everything else, so this is one quadrant, and this is using just a box fall off to make sure that it's in this one area. And the effector, because it's a shader effector, it's going to use a shader. If we go in here and turn this off, this is just any noise just to kind of break up you know, where it's moving based on the effector. And then the whole key of this kind of animation is just using a 2D circular kind of animation so that it starts from here as like a little tiny circle and as it grows out it kind of fans out and kind of grows that animation across the rest of the effector the effector itself and kind of this quadrant system is just using you know this like negative 30 negative 30 will get it kind of in one direction and then if you just kind of invert those in different directions as you tile it on a clockwise you can get the rest of them to follow that so that's what the expression here is doing is just taking this shader that we're using here that's animating and making sure all of these shaders are using the same one. And because it's gradient noise in world space, this center point is the same for all of them. There's no UV mapping or anything. It all works together. So if we turn all of these on, they're all using the same thing. And it just kind of gives you that idea that they're all bending in. And the only thing you really have to change in the parameters is that this is like negative 30, negative 30, negative 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, negative 30. So that's just kind of making sure that you keep pointing into the center point. And then on top of that, just having these two effectors. So there's one called random R. So this is just giving it, if you turn this on, just a little bit of more random rotation so they don't look like they're all using the same shader. And then on top of that, using this pushback. So this is just a plane effector. It's making sure if you go to the side view that they're kind of going backwards in Z space. And this is done just with its own spherical animation here. So it kind of grows out from that center so it's not using that shader because I found that that didn't work as well for what I wanted to use. And so just animating this one kind of sphere out helps it kind of move backwards in space here. So if we turn that on, you can kind of see the generation of how it breaks from the back up to the front. And so all of those together, using the same just fracture object, are all just stacked inside there. And they um, kind of give you this effect on the end that you can kind of, with a couple you know, render settings and everything, is believable that it's slow motion, it's art directable, and it's really quick, uh, really quick to render inside of cinema and kind of you know tweak as the art director wants. So that is everything that I really wanted to go over. Thank you to Maxon again. My website is my last name, Terex.com. Uh, I have some stuff there, and all my social media is just at Isaac Terex, just my full name. Yeah, I'm a freelancer in New York, and I work with a bunch of people here. Um, my email is also just Isaac at Terex.com is where you can kind of email me. And uh, some of these files probably will be put up later, hosted on my website, or Maxon will find a place to host them, Cineversity. But you can kind of dig through all that espresso that we covered and all the different files. So yeah, if you have any questions, also just hit me up, social media, anywhere.